I'd like to welcome you tonight on behalf of National Parks and Friends of Narrabeen Lagoon Catchment. National Parks Association. Sorry, I have to correct you. Yeah. National Parks Association. And I'd like to um, welcome residents, candidates, our amazing MC, Wendy Harmer. And also, before we start, I'd like to invite Neil Evers. Come up. Thanks so much, Neil, for a First Nations welcome. Thank you, Steve. Yes, good evening, and, and to our distinguished guests. Welcome to the evening. Yes, I'm a Garingai man from the Wanajini Garingai clan, and um, I can trace my heritage back to about 1775. So, been here a long time. I was born at Colroy, and uh, I would like to pay respect to my elders past, present, and those of the future. But also I'd like to acknowledge their wisdom and their courage and their insight. The Aboriginals of old cared for the place. They cared for each other. And I guess that's what we expect of councillors today. So it's up to us to make sure that we have the right ones. Aboriginals of old would uh, sit around in a circle and they'd just have a yarn. They'd talk to one another. And what really confused the English was they used to write heavy dick in the sand. And when they were finished, they rubbed it out. So that really got them going. Well, it won't be happening here tonight, will it? No. Maybe. <laughs> But it's, it's a thrill to be here for me, uh, being a local boy. Um, I now live at Newport. I often go out and give these talks and people will say, so how far have you come? I think every Aboriginal person lives at Dubbo or somewhere. And I uh, said, so, well, I've come quite a long way from Newport. And uh, yeah, it's all good fun. But look, it's a serious thing tonight. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. And uh, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to the country of my ancestors. And uh, I, I guess the key word tonight is respect. Respect for all of these people here and respect for ourselves. So on that, I'd like to, on behalf of my ancestors, welcome you. Thank you. We know that your democracy is all about those who turn up, so give yourself a round of applause for being here. Fantastic. My name is Wendy Harmer. I have lived now in Collaroy, in the same place there, I can't believe it, for 30 years this year. Um, I still think of myself as a Victorian, but there you go. And I don't think that you get to be a local up this way until you probably lived here for about oh, four generations or so. But I've always been very involved in the local politics here and it has been fascinating to see the evolution of the council over that time. Of course, the amalgamation of council and all that means and the ebb and flow of parties and personalities. It's all been fascinating. So if you don't mind, I will sit and uh, get this underway and I'll uh, just do a bit of a round robin first, if you don't mind, and start from over here. And if you would stand up and tell people who you are and uh, who, you, who you are representing in this particular campaign. Okay, so my name is Sue Hines. I'm currently the mayor. Uh, I represent your northern beaches to me and we're all in orange, so hopefully we stand out. Um, what can I tell you? Uh, this will be my fourth term on council. 
I've represented Kill Kill twice, narrow being once, and this time I'm heading out to French's Forest Ward where I actually live. So for the very first time, I will represent the place that I actually live. Thanks, Sue. Just part of you pass the microphone along. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Ruth Robins. I am currently the number one um, councillor for Narrabeen Ward and for your Northern Beaches Independent Team. Good evening, everybody. My name is Roy Dillon, and I'm the number one um, for candidate for Pitwood Ward, and I'm very proud of our community. Hi everyone, my name is Judy Sharno. I've lived in this district a lot longer than Wendy Harmer has. <laughs> I'm standing in Pitwater and I'm the number two for the Pitwater Ward. Good evening everyone and thank you for having me. My name is Jolene Hackman and I'm standing as a number one for your Northern Beaches independent team uh, in Coco. And I ran in the state election against the Environment Minister because I wanted more clear action on the environment. Thank you. Hi everybody, thanks for having me here tonight. My name is Sue Wright and um, I'm representing the Labor Party and I'm the number one candidate in the Narrabeen Ward. Thank you. Oh, and Wendy, I am fourth generation Northern Beaches. <laughs> <laughs> okay, rub it in, rub it in, keep going. Uh, good day everyone. Sorry, I've uh, only had about four hours sleep with a newborn at home, but um, my name's Ryan O'Sullivan. I'm second on the uh, ticket for Labor uh, with Sue for Narrabeen Ward, so hopefully we can uh, make a difference. Hi, I'm Kristen Glanville. I'm one of the current councillors for Colco Ward. Um, I'm the lead candidate for the Greens in Colco, and I'm super excited to continue on all the unfinished business that I only got halfway through on the first term and looking forward to finishing it off with all you guys in the community. Hi guys, nice to be here with you on Garrigal Land. Thanks for welcoming us on Kilneal. My name's Bonnie Harvey and I am the lead on the ticket for the Greens in the Manly Ward. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ethan Hernjack. I'm your lead Greens candidate for French's Forest and I just wanted to thank Uncle Neil for welcoming us today and for all of you for showing up. Uh, my first debate for council three years ago, there were two people in the audience, so this is a, a massive improvement, so thank you all for coming. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Rand Corsi, I'm the current Pitwater Greens councillor and I'm number one on our Greens ticket for Pitwater. Um, I've also lived in the district for 30 years, although it's only been the last 20 that I've been in Pitwater, we slowly moved our way north to paradise, so, and I'm standing because I want to protect it. Thank you very much. Now I think there are a couple of other candidates, are there in the audience? Let's just see where you are. There's some more Greens candidates there, and some others as well. Welcome to you, thanks. We, hopefully we will both get to you later on. Okay, let's get to the elephant in the room. Are there any Liberals here to see? <laughs> All right, I want a show of hands from you do you, uh, are you, let me put it this way, um, are you disappointed that you will not be able to vote for a Liberal candidate in this election? Do you feel you are disenfranchised? Yes or no? Yes, you do. <coughs> no, the rest, no, you don't. Okay, so there are a few. Okay, and so I want to go to the Mayor and I want to ask you, obviously, I mean, this has been national news that the Liberals have not managed to um, to um, nominate. I want you to tell me what you think uh, that is going to look like for the council coming up and is it going to change the order of business? I think we're all absolutely fascinated on that one. Can we have the microphone over here, Ethan? Thank you. I think the answer is yes. Yes to what? Uh, yes, it will change the order of business. Yes, it will make, I think, council a lot more collegiate. I think um, my experience on council with this particular term is many of us actually want to work together. However, um, apologies in advance to um, defected from our party. Um, and that, I think, caused an imbalance. One went to the Liberals and 
a one I think always has been a Liberal in his mind. He just thought he was independent. Um, but anyway, to negate that, I've made sure all my number ones now are female and we're all very aligned. <laughs> are you saying, though, Amir, that um, having uh, Liberal members in the council has um, made it divisive? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Uh, there okay. has been a difference in thinking between the Liberals um, associated with the Northern branches. And how would you, how would you um, characterise that difference? Very conservative, quite right of centre, um, whereas the Liberal branches I've dealt with down south tend to be a little bit more centred. Okay. And so what impact um, has that division, do you think, have, has had on council business over the past few years, over the last term? After, over the last term, it's been very challenging because um, they want to see that they're not seen to be voting as a block, so they will deliberately vote differently on different items, but make sure that if it's a really challenging decision, the mayor gets the casting vote, because they've looked around the room and decided we'll make it 50-50 because we don't want to have the blame, or if they're absolutely against it, then they will make sure that the majority um, will vote the way that they want them to vote. Okay, I'm going to hand over the microphone to a couple of other um, sitting councillors as well, but it does sound um, as if um, you have found your Liberal, you know, Liberal councillors to be, as I say, quite divisive and, 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 and I think throwing a spanner in council business. But how do you, how do you address this gentleman down the front here who, who says he's going to not have the opportunity to vote for the Liberal Party? What do you say to him? It's not that entirely. I just think that the community has been robbed of a fair choice. The community has been robbed of a fair choice. What do you say to that? I agree. I agree. I, I find it actually embarrassing that Ethan and I, at a ballot draw, there were two of us. That's it, two parties. And as Ethan quite rightly said, we could have flipped a coin as to who got box A and who got box B. That's, that's not democracy. Okay. And um, let's hand it over to Miranda. Christy, I'm mean, Miranda, either of you from the, from the Greens. Tell me about your experience of working with the Liberals and how you think it will be different. It was a mixed bag. I found that if I picked my issues properly, that I could get them to vote for my motions. Um, you know, there were some consensus things. They acknowledged housing affordability. They voted for my motion on that. They voted for my motion on um, improving council's compliance functions. So um, there were some issues where we could have a meeting of minds. I think where the rubber really hit the road was um, Ones where the influence of 2GB and Sky News kind of media really um, influenced them on things like, um, you know, we, we voted as a chamber to have a new consultative body with our Aboriginal community, something that's been long overdue. And unfortunately, um, the, the Liberal councillors filed a rescission and then um, had it reversed. And that's a real, that's, as one Aboriginal community member said to me, it's, it's embarrassing that a chamber of 15 non-Aboriginal people are deciding whether we should have a method to consult with council. And it was those sorts of things. I mean, anything to do with climate change, we they would vote against anything. So it was a mixed bag. And, and I think, unfortunately, um, because at times they needed to justify the decisions of past Liberal governments or collaborate with Liberal MPs and other levels. Sometimes I think it forced them to not be objective about the needs of the community rather than protecting or sort of standing up for the needs of the party, which is um, very un unfortunate. But um, I don't know, Miranda, did you have anything to add? Um, yes, I would say the people haven't been robbed. I would say that it's just a stuff up, and I feel, um, I feel, you know, I feel for the Liberal councillors and the candidates who were ready to stand up and, you know, spent thousands of dollars on materials, and 
I have a huge amount of respect for some of them. I mean, people like um, oh, David, I can't think of his surname. Oh yeah, David Walton, who um, is very focused on governance and for his party to have let him down like this, I think is a tragedy. And I do also accept that there are a lot of people on the Northern Beaches who are um, perhaps not as, um, well, who are economically very conservative. Um, some of them are socially as well, and they feel that they, you know, the Liberals represent them. So I accept that as part of democracy. But, um, yeah, it's not the democratic system that's let the public down, it's the Liberal Party that's let the public down. We are going to be looking at a very different, uh, that's a very reasonable response, I think, people would agree. Um, we are going to be looking at a very different council, aren't we? Because we are losing six Liberals, there's one through retirement, but five uh, Liberal councillors out of 15. So I imagine, Sue, that, or you might like to hand this over to one of your colleagues. Um, you are, I, I, I'm fascinated by this because, I mean, I, I think that you'll probably end up with the tag of the all-female, lefty, ratbag, council of the North. What do you reckon? I think we've been called worse than that in the past, actually. <laughs> okay. So, if you had, maybe you can hand the microphone down a bit and say, uh, I'm and I might ask you as well, how do you think this is going to pan out? It's fascinating. Well, first I'd like to concur with both what Miranda and Kristen and Sue said with the past. Um, and just like to add, one of my very big frustrations was when we had discussions around budget and within 30 seconds into the budget discussions, you knew that the Liberals weren't going to support it. So, and um, I found that really very frustrating, like I said. To me, the new council is exciting. I um, always said I don't believe that there's a role for party politics, and I believe that very strongly. It's, it's grassroots democracy. It's a group of people that love where they live and that they um, bring the voice of their local communities. And I see it as a gentle council where hopefully, and I'm pretty certain that this will work together on some really good community-based outcomes. Things which our community have been talking about and asking about for a long time. And um, I'm excited for that. Well, let's go to the Labor Party, who are standing in Narrabeen. We've got to Sue Wright and Brian O'Sullivan. What does this opportunity look like for the Labor Party, Sue? Um, it's, I think it's a good chance to have a good balance on council. Uh, we haven't had a Labor councillor for a very long time. Um, and there are Labor voters in the community that would like to be represented. Um, Labor's, um, as you all know, it's a, it's a party that looks after um, uh, Medicare, you know, the sick members of our community, um, the NDIS, um, affordable and sociable housing. All those things are really strong Labor policies, so I think that that's something that we could bring to council, definitely. Okay, and uh, Ryan, do you see yourself with a chance? Uh, if you can get up in the, you know, certain. stay up that late at night with the baby. Uh, yeah, um, I think it's going to be good. Um, I've uh, been a frontline worker for New South Wales government for about 15 years. I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. In um, what area, right? Uh, I'm not supposed to say, but I'll say that I've uh, used to represent the Northern Beaches Police Association for about for a couple of years. I used to be the uh, the the head of it down here. Mm -hmm. Now I'm doing it elsewhere. But um, uh, what I think a, a Labor candidate will do for the community is uh, represent the uh, people like myself that work government jobs that want to live in the area. Uh, with affordable housing, um, they've sort of been left behind uh, with the former uh, councillors. Um, so hopefully we can we can add to that and, and help the everyday people on the northern beaches that are up and coming with families like myself um, and, and young people. Okay, well let's uh, let's uh, go to the questions uh, that you have wanted asked this evening and we'll get through, we've got a list of them here. So let's go first and foremost to social and affordable housing. 
Now, the Council's Towards 2040 document seeks a minimum of 10% social and affordable rental housing to be included in new planning proposals. However, the Council has contradicted its own requirements in the Master Plan for Brookvale and has reduced that minimum requir requirement to 5% based on a, quote, feasibility analysis. We love those, don't we? <laughs> Which would say that the, the redevelopment would not be viable with a requirement to contribute more than 5% um, affordable housing. So I'll, I'll get, while you're on the topic there, Ryan, what do you think of the, uh, what do you think of that goal? 10% um, watered down to 5% on the advice of who, we wonder. Uh, Sue's got a speech ready, so I'll let her as a number we one. We don't want speeches tonight, I should oh, say. Not a speech, but uh, 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 she's, uh, uh, okay. she's the best person a to response. speak on this subject. So okay, what do, you, what do you say? That's right. Thank you. Um, I've just got notes. Okay, well, we like that. We don't want we don't need <laughs> speeches, I don't think. No, no, it's not a speech. Um, so um, there was um, surprise, I think disappointment, that um, the... the um, the minimum required requirement for affordable housing was reduced. Um, it's a really important part of the um, the master plans for all the community. So the Brookvale one's been reduced, which is a shame because um, it would be a good area uh, with all the medical facilities and everything else. So yeah. affordable housing. Yeah, but why was it re reduced, uh, Sue? Can we hand it up to Sue, the mayor? Add some to this. Yes, add some, do add some context. Okay, so council has um, a policy of 10%. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of Brookvale, because the land where um, the planning is happening and the first group to put their hands up to say, we'll take the housing, is Centre Group, who is part of Westfield, mm -hmm. they've put forward that if they did anything more than 5% um, uh, um, housing, social housing, or sorry, affordable housing on there, that they would not be able to make a profit. Did you and, believe them? Uh, yes, because well, they've, hang on, let me, let me put the context in. Their grand plan is actually a hell of a lot more housing on that car park along Pitwater Road. So council only had zoned part, very small part of that. Um, so they're saying police service is not enough. Um, but then again, they've got a whole, they've got an idea for a whole heap more. Okay, so what does that push the percentage to then in that case? Well, in that case, we don't know because we don't... Well, why did you accept that deal if you don't because know? Because in, in looking at the future, um, we don't want all the housing on one owner's land. We actually want to share no, it out. No, this, this is about percentages, isn't oh, it? Oh, okay. Well, then on the other side, you've got um, French's Forest Town Centre, where we've um, agreed to 15% housing there. However, we wanted more than 15%. So um, at the same time, the Minister for Housing said, um, that they would like to do 40-50% on, on um, particularly government-owned land. So uh, as the Mayor, I wrote in and said, well, French's Forest is actually on educational land, your land. Um, we'll take a percentage, anything higher than 15%, and got a very polite letter back saying, thanks, but no thanks. I guess this is a broader issue, isn't it, um, when we look at local government, is um, how much... Um, you know, power has been taken from local councils. How um, little, how um, you know, less and less chance you have to influence zonings, um, housing, planning, etc. Where do you see that going? Is it getting any better with the Labor government, or is it is going backwards? I feel that there's been a lot of promises made, but not much traction at all. And I mean, I just think of other things that we see happening, which is the defunding of mental health and health issues on the Northern Beaches. But quietly I'm hearing back that, well, we've had to pull back on a lot of things that we were funding because we're now trying to fund the key workers and give you know teachers and nurses more money. Um, it just feels like you're, you're robbing one and to pay the other. But at the end of the day, we're missing out. 
Do you, well, um, I, I might hand over to the Greens here, if yeah. I may. I'm sorry, we've just got. We Marianne. ideally we had yeah. We ideally we'd have one microphone per table. Um, in the light, uh, as we just heard there, um, of, of the government, as I say, um, you know, um, taking more and more um, responsibility from local councils. Um, what is the possibility of pushing back on that? Do you think? Well. Look, I think affordable housing and housing supply in general is a much broader issue and I personally don't think we should be trying to squeeze as many people as we possibly can into Sydney. Local government has a very limited um, number of ways that it can improve affordable housing. Labor has actually given us an opening uh, by increasing its uh, requirements for density in uh, the R2 and R3 zones. And so we can make sure on council that um, where there's what they call up uplift, where you're going from a, a lower density area to a higher density area, those are actually the only areas we, where we can demand that um, developers provide affordable housing. And so we now have the opportunity to demand that um, in those areas where there's going to be uplift. So I think that's something that we're going to need to be doing. All right, and then pass it on to Ethan there. What's your thoughts? Thank Ethan? you. Um, to answer your question, I think it is difficult for council to push back on the developers to try to increase that. It's very much what is viable for them, rather what's best for the community, and trying to look at it through the lens of the developers have to contribute to the affordable housing that's built on the northern beaches. Um, it can't be the single solution to this issue. Um, if anything, I think it's a band-aid, but what we need is a multi-pronged approach. We need to look at um, Kristen got a motion through in the last term for council to look at building affordable housing on its own land. Um, and that's just one of the many ways council can use our limited power to actually make a difference. Um, but the other thing we can do, and what I'm passionate at looking at, is the new LEP, trying to diversify the types of planning we have on the northern beaches, mm -hmm. give young people, older people, and essential workers houses like duplexes and multi-unit dwellings where they can afford to live. Um, but yeah, the single family house on the quarter acre block isn't going to suffice, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Yes, yes, you may. Um, here we go. Yeah. 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 Hi, everyone. Um, I think as well, we need to acknowledge that we are suffering the consequences of planning that didn't happen for the decade before this. We're all feeling that squeeze now. And so the Labor state government has inherited a problem that we're all scrambling to fix. And I think that we all know that there are changes coming down from the state government that is going to represent a challenge at local government level. They're currently developing a pattern book where preconceived ideas for houses will be automatically approved. And that presents a problem at local council level because local council has clear housing targets and we need to make sure that we have infrastructure that's going to support those, those homes. And in my analysis that I've seen, we have a lot of land that we are able to do a lot of things with. Where so would you say that is? No, just on the, on the quarter acre block. I mean, we A lot of land, but a quarter acre block obviously is someone's backyard. I mean, uh, Ethan says that there are council uh, properties, see, you know, council. Yeah, like single story community centres or car parks. Yeah, uh, do, you, yeah. do you see opportunities for property that the council owns for housing? I don't know specifically in this council and I can't speak to that obviously yet. I'm, I'm in the interview process for this job. But I am a sustainable housing lead for a domestic violence charity and I've been working with different areas across the country to see where council owned land can be utilised. Mm -hmm. But that is, there are possibilities. I think what I want to be really mindful of is looking at what's going to come down from the state level, what we can do at the local government to make sure that it is going to fit in and protect the canopy of pit water and all of the northern beaches that we love mm. and the reason that we're all here. But we need to make sure that families can stay together and the community can stay yeah. together. It's interesting, um, next week I am um, moderating a big discussion in Karingai about the uh, planning laws on behalf of uh, Elizabeth Farrelly, you know, um, Elizabeth Farrelly. She has got a group called Better Cities and this uh, group is going right round Sydney uh, to challenge those rezonings 
which as we know, are bl often blanket rezonings and don't take into account that local amenity. And you know, as we know, every locality is different. I feel very strongly about this, that it, it's got to be a two-way street. The community has to be looked, uh, you know, when the community has to be listened to, and uh, the blanket rezonings are not good for anyone. Thoughts, Mayor? Uh, my heart goes out to Karingai. Um, the Todds that were put forward about um, immediate uplift around train stations means that a council like Karingai with five train stations in it will automatically become a very changed area. Um, and what do you say, of course, there are people across Sydney who say, oh, yeah, yeah, nimby, nimby, nimby. What do you say to that? Well, where it'll affect um, our council area um, is, oh, we don't, uh, you don't have train stations, so that's a good thing in a way. But I didn't Brom and Bishop just anyway. Yeah, don't, don't go back to <laughs> don't go back too far. Um, but something that has come through with our now um, LEPs is that traditionally Pitwater and um, Manly um, previous councils did allow um, dual occupancy. Boringa didn't. With the new planning laws in now, all of Boringa suddenly is, and that's a very large area. And there will be a time where a lot of residents will suddenly realise they're sitting on a block of land that they can add dual locks to. Great, in one part of that, we now got opportunity to help house, but the bad side of this is there's no infrastructure that goes with this. So this instantly means more cars, more pressure on water supply, more pressure on sewerage, all of that kind of infrastructure that you don't think about energy supplies. So that is something that's going to be happening and can happen virtually now. Mm. Interesting. Okay, I know that you want to have a go at this one. Um, yeah, no, this is a subject that I'm really keen about. I mean, like a lot of younger people, um, I can't afford to move out of the hermit crab shell that I currently live in. Um, and I know that that's a, so many people my age have moved out of the area and moved to the central coast because the area is just getting so expensive. Um, I think that there are some more things that council could do. One of the things I'm really excited about that sort of fell out of my motion was that we're looking at sort of broadening the type of contribution because we, I think we had this idea that we could charge 10% for rezonings, but we haven't had a huge number of rezonings. And then with Brookvale, the feasibility analysis suggested that it wouldn't, um, you know, the developers just basically wouldn't bother redeveloping because of the, the margin. Um, so instead, the model we're now looking at is a small contribution, but on a much larger type of development. So not just rezonings, but looking at a small percentage on all development. And that, I think, has a lot of benefits. There's a lot of parts of the Northern Beaches that are currently not levying any affordable housing contributions. Um, and also, if, you know, past Liberal governments and the current Labor government are really doubling down on the kind of top-down planning approach of using SEPs to increase housing, having that type of contribution means that we can still capture um, affordable housing contributions from more types of development um, even if there's not technically a rezoning, because technically the um, low and medium density code is not a rezoning, and so it wouldn't actually attract that 10% um, aspiration. So I think there's, I mean, I think there's other things we could do. I think we've got car parks and community centres that we could be building affordable housing on. Lots of other councils, like in the West, have been looking at this, and certainly once we start getting the money in. <laughs> People drive cars and they attend community um, facilities. Are you saying that you would build on top of those or would you just sell off the properties on which those car parks and those community facilities sit? No, I mean, I think we would go up. We have to be smarter with how we have the land is a scarce resource and we have to be smarter about how we're using it. There are places where we have an at grade car park in the centre of a high density area. We could build there, you know, continue parking, community space, social housing, 
market housing um, in new mixed-use complexes. And once we have the contributions coming in from this policy, policy, we will actually have the money to do it, which in the past council has struggled with. But, I mean, there's other things. Another thing I really would like council to have the power to do, but the state government doesn't allow us, is to charge higher council rates on properties that are used as Airbnbs or a vacant. We have something like in the order of 5,000 properties that are in the Northern Beaches used for Airbnbs or vacant. And I think it's a real tragedy in a housing crisis. You know, I have nothing against weekenders or Airbnbs, but in a housing crisis, those things are sort of nice to have rather than fulfilling the basic human need of having a roof over your head. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. That seems to get a tick charging um, higher higher rates on Airbnbs. Let's go to, and I know that this is very dear to Connie Harris's heart, and she has been so, um, um, worked so hard to organise tonight. Let's go to Lizard Rock, uh, Connie, which I know that is number one on your list there. Do you oppose the Lizard Rock planning proposal? And uh, if so, or if what actions do you commit to as a councillor to address this? Do you oppose it? Do you support it? Um, where can we go to? Let's um, go to uh, number two on the on the desk there, if we may. Yep, yep. From the uh, your Northern Beaches group. Thank you. Um, absolutely oppose it. I mean, forty-five sorry homes over forty-five football fields in a um, a fire high fire. Um, access is wrong. Um, what I would do, and hopefully, thinking of the future, we will actually have a strong voice on the council in opposing it, which I think was missing last term, and uh, advocate for it and certainly support all the community groups that were advocating for it too. Okay, thank you. And uh, I've got your name here, is Kristen? No, she's Kristen, i Bonnie, I beg your pardon. Um, thoughts on that, Bonnie? Well, Kristen, Ethan, and I'm sure Miranda have been campaigning very hard on this, and as much as I love the sound of my own voice, I don't want to be the person to talk on this because I am not the most involved in the campaign, so. Um, um, so first of all, hands off Lizard Rock. I'm glad that almost everyone on the panel, I think, can agree uh, with that. But I guess what we need to discuss is what happens after the outcome um, is delivered to us from the planning minister. Um, so with the Greens, and especially Kristen, I just want to thank you for your help. So we got a petition delivered to New South Wales Parliament with over 12,000 signatures, and that's how much the community has stood up against this, and that's unprecedented. Um, Basically, the next council, whoever does get elected, will have to deal with the fallout or hopefully the positive news that the planning minister has overturned it. Um, but by voting green, you know that whatever happens, we're gonna be strong advocates for protecting our bush and standing up against inappropriate development, no matter who, no matter who, uh, who it comes from. Um, we yeah. might um, ask. Does that, does that include state government developments? Which probably I think is one of the most commercial identities in the state. We do the best we can when it comes to state, but obviously they do overpower us. Well, okay, um, we, we, might, we might leave sorry. that till, yeah. Uh, Labor Party, we might ask you to have, say something about Lizard Rock. We, we'll have time for Q&A later on if you... Okay, so um, I've opposed Lizard Rock, the plan development from the beginning. Um, uh, Northern Beaches Lean, of which I'm the coordinator, we submitted an objection um, to the proposal earlier this year. Um, so, um, and I also spoke to Paul Scully, the Minister for Planning, um, and explained our reasons for opposing the plan. Uh, as we all know the reasons for opposing, you know, there's so, so many reasons. And um, I think that we really all have to stick together on this mm -hmm. as a community, always. Um, so I will always collaborate with um, community efforts to stop this development. Um, we need to emphasise the need for conservation over development in this area. We also need to advocate for a comprehensive review of the planning proposal, I think, highlighting alternative solutions that protect the environment and also the potential residents. So um, the environmental part is a huge, the majority of our concerns, 
but there's also the bushfire risk to the residents that they're just going to pop down in that valley. Okay. So um, there's a lot of concerns. Thank okay, you. thank you for that. Let's move on to, this is number six in the questions that are, uh, we're asking tonight. Oh yes, go right ahead. Can I just mention that I campaigned on this issue during the state election and uh, the Australian, the esteemed literary source, <laughs> has us campaigning against it and I think it's something that we are all working together on and I just wanted to ask if you could give a round of applause please to Kristen, Dr Connie, Sarah Baker and Rachel Lee Jackson who have pushed this issue, supported by our team as well, because I think it's something that is so critical. While uh, we do need to have uh, Aboriginal determination uh, and their ability to economise their land, this is the lungs of our community and it's super important that we protect this beautiful bushland and if economic independence needs to be, needs to come to fruition, then it's possible for a land swap deal somewhere else and to preserve that bushland. Let's go to synthetic turf. Hands up in the audience who um, agrees that we that this is a, a, a suitable um, a suitable material for our sporting fields. Hands up. And those who don't, okay. Well, we pretty much nailed that. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. Go on. So, I just want to announce tonight that I'm launching our Greens um, petition against synthetic turf. We've had a number of motions on council um, over the last two terms, actually, against synthetic turf and it's got closer to being banned each time. So I'm hoping that with the next council we might get a little bit closer and if we have a petition with lots of signatures it might make a difference. So this won't just be a you know election thing, we'll be keeping it going, but I mean, I think it looks like everybody here understands the problems that um, it's even when you have um, a, a cork underlay, you still get microplastics washing off the surface of it, they still end up in um, our waterways and ocean, um, the temperatures that they get up to are something like 70 degrees, even when you've just got an ordinary sort of 25, 27 degrees Sydney day. Um, so then councils end up um, uh, basically fencing them off, so they're not open to the public all the time. Um, the cost of them is about three times, the lifetime cost of them is about three times that of um, the natural turf. Once they're damaged, they're damaged, that's it, you have to chuck them out. And there's one out at Bella Vista now, which is the um, uh, soccer headquarters, and they've got one that, it's a new one, it's already damaged, and so, um, you know, this all, you can't recycle it properly, so they just have multiple problems, so. Yeah, I was going to add that um, in the last term of council, we tried to get up a moratorium you know, one of the big issues is that you can't recycle it once it's um, been pulled up. And it's unfortunate that our sporting communities are so wedded to the idea of having synthetic turf. And I get it because um, there's a shortage of playing fields, but it's a very short term solution to use something that's unrecyclable and ultimately derived from fossil fuels um, in order to have that, you know, fix a short term problem rather than asking deeper questions about how we can more innovatively use our space, um, whether there needs to be some reallocation of how we use public space in order to have enough playing fields. But, um, you know, I, the, the motion that we tried to put up to, to call for a moratorium, um, I was disappointed that it didn't get up and I'm really hoping that with the new batch of councillors um, we can finally get it over the line because if nothing else, the chief scientist is still working um, on what best practice looks like in this space and we're trucking on through the problem, um, pandering to a particular part of the community with, and you know at Cromer Park there was a big stack of this unrecyclable stuff attracting vermin. We really have to think more long term about not using, and this across across the board, across all of council's business, um, not using materials that have no end of life process 
Yes. Sue, the mayor. Yep, sure. Just adding a little bit of context. Um, the reason that the synthetic rolls were sitting there for so long at Cromer is there's currently a recycling facility being built at Albury Wodonga, especially for that. So that's why it was sitting there that long. Okay. Cool. I'm going to ask you a question without notice, folks. Um, in, um, in 2023, the council unanimously endorsed a motion to ask the state government to uh, look at the issue of seawalls, and I quote, to review an all alter alternative options to ensure effective property, coastal and environmental protection. In light of the overwhelming community stain for the vertical concrete seawall at Polaroi Narrabeen Beach, and the fact that the council is now taking itself to the Land and Environment Court over a similar beach development at Newport, if you're elected, what is the council's next step on seawalls? What should the policy be? Miranda? Um, Okay, so obviously I'm extremely opposed to them. They um, basically the sea wall, as you can see at Collaroy, has eroded out the beach. Um, you know, it's not a good short-term solution. It's not a good long-term solution. I mean, unless we do something to stop climate change and sea level rise, we're going to lose you know land right along the northern beaches, billions of dollars worth of property, um, and we're going to need dikes all along our beaches. So we won't have any beaches. So it's not a good long-term solution either. So I've already put up, I put up a motion, I can't remember, a long time ago when I first got onto council about it and it was knocked back. Um, I don't know how much I can say, but I put a motion up that was in confidential session um, at our last council meeting, which... Um, um, was that so, the moratorium or... I can't say what things? it was about, but what I can say is that this is coming to um, the Land Environment Court for hearing, I think, on the 18th to 20th of September, and I was totally opposed to that happening. I think it's a complete waste of money. The council's already spent $200,000 on fighting this case in court. The case is about the Narrabeen Surf Club, who want to build, build a seawall into the front of that New, surf club. Newport. Uh, what did I say? New yeah. New oh, Newport. Newport, sorry. Uh, and Councillor Causey, confidentiality, please. Yeah, I haven't said anything that isn't public knowledge. So, um, so the um, so at the Land Environment Coring Court hearing that knocked back that uh, proposal, there were three. Um, this is publicly available knowledge. It's on the council website, I think. I've certainly seen it. I, I accessed it through public avenues. There were three experts, coastal management experts on that panel who knocked back that seawall on environmental grounds and also on the grounds that the council doesn't have uh, a current coastal management program is what it's called, which is how you, that basically guides your development on the coast. And in fact, we don't have a single coastal management uh, program in place for the whole of the Northern Beach as a current program, which is ridiculous environmentally it's also ridiculous because if we had it in place we could get money to actually be um, working on developments on the coast on coastal protection so yeah i mean i will keep fighting sea walls that are vertical sea walls along the northern beaches i set up a coastal uh, working group with um, that i had a little bit of support for um, we haven't got very far but if i'm re-elected i would i will be continuing to push for um, sensible, well not just sensible, I mean simply recognising what is happening to our environment, to our coastal environment and that we need to have, if we're going to have short term solutions, they need to protect our beaches. If we're getting to the point where we have long term solutions then we're going to have to deal with the issue at a, a, a much deeper level. Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to think where to start. Um, so, um, with um, the sea walls, uh, currently at the moment, the sea walls that were identified and needing to be built 
um, have been built. There is another one about to go in at the end of a particular street. That one is a rock revetment. However, um, in the time, and, and we've got to remember, technology keeps changing. What the good thing was, well, of, uh, hang on a second. Does I know a mean, lot about this technology. I am sure and you know and I know that that technology you put down there is 19th century standard. Well, it was, uh, I know. Brutalist engineering. Okay, it went to court. I know that it was fought, but the coastal engineers, at the end of the day, won. However, I will say this, having gone back down to the water laboratories down at um, Manly Vale, where they are actually testing walls, dams for all different builds across the world, I've already seen their next iteration. So there is different technologies that's constantly testing wave motion, and it was actually fascinating to watch what they've already anticipating what would be the next version. You know you know that it's sand nourishment, by the way. You know that, don't you? Sorry? You know that the answer here is revetment walls and sand nourishment. Yes, so we have another um, thing coming up where we've talked about and voted on a long-term solution. It actually breaks my heart because it's about sand pumping. Um, which I just don't know how I really feel about that. Sand that's pumping, there, you know, there is a big, uh, that, that has already been scoped extensively, yes. that there are big sand deposits off the coast here that match the sand on these beaches, and that you know, report was done like a decade ago, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it was um, a reaction, if you like, to the thinking of what it's going to look and feel like having those pipes running down the beach. They don't have pipes running. Yeah. Well, you can do it with offshore barges, but anyway, I move on. Yeah, yeah. I, I realise this is a very much passionate topic. Yeah, well, you, you are called the Northern Beaches, <laughs> so it should be a, a primary concern, and you should be up with the latest technology. They are what bring, they are what bring an enormous amount of revenue into this place where we live and they should be number one priority. I yep. And I, I absolutely um, am aware that there is, like I said, new technology being watched all the time. The only thing I can say is what's been built there now isn't on public beach, it's on private land. That, that is absolutely debatable by the way. Well, we will agree to disagree, okay. Wendy. <laughs> Uh, so I too oppose the seawalls. Um, the preservation of our beaches is so important. Um, we all, everyone that grew up here knows what it's like going to the beach and um, we just need to stop building the seawalls. So if I was on council, I would um, be seeking that we amend the LEP to prohibit vertical seawalls anywhere on the northern beaches. Ultimately it comes down to the fact that ratepayers are paying for the reduction and eventual destruction of our beaches. So I don't think we should do that. Um, I think we should find a lot harder and uh, use a lot more natural ways to, to fix this problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing too is the cost to council. Um, it costs a lot, at, like the council share of, um, of these seawalls. And ultimately it's just going to be that there's no beach left. The seawalls, ocean, that's it. So all the good surf breaks, all the local surfers, all that kind of thing. My brother and his mates, everyone who's got brothers and mates knows how much time they spend at Southie. Used to spend at Southie um, looking at the surf break. It's a different surf break now and it's not nearly the same. You do that along the northern beaches. Uh, what happens to our North Narrabeen surf competition in five years' time? It's not going to be there. All those, you know, great beaches, they're never going to be the same. I tutor high school students and they cover the problems associated with seawalls in year 10 geography and they write assignments on the successes of sand bypass systems and if they can get their head around it I think that we can as well. I'm a surfer, a female surfer and we are fucking we disdain that seawall very much and I think it's 
symbolic of a grander trend happening here on the Northern Beaches where people with more money are prioritised. And I, I, I got no money, I can't relate to that. I'm a young person. And my rates going forward, if I can afford to live on the beaches based on affordable housing, will be paying for that damn sea well. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, from, um, from the sea to up the back of it, the bush. Let's go to the question that we have here about um, a cover, about um, our bush cover. Where have I got that here? That I think you can see it up there. The tree canopy, Northern Beaches tree loss. Northern Beaches Council data indicates that since 2016 we have lost about 30,000 trees, not including those removed illegally or under the state 1050 clearing laws. And while uh, councils planted a similar number, small saplings will take decades to replicate the functions of those trees. What um, do we think of the council's 2023 canopy plan? Have you had a look at that, Ethan? And what do you, what's your thoughts there? Um, so first of all, I just wanted to thank Miranda and Kristen for their work in advancing the tree canopy plan. And uh, we are still waiting on substantive progress on that. Um, ultimately, I think it comes down to the issue of environmental compliance again, because if we want to tr uh, keep our tree canopy, we need council officers maintaining and keeping records of where the tree canopy is. And um, the Greens have put forward motions in the past to increase our environmental compliance team by double, but it would just be nice to have all the positions in that team be filled for a start, I think, um, and it's something we could try to work towards. Um, but of course, the urban heat island effect is something that we're very lucky as a council to have largely mitigated for the moment. Um, but what I have noticed is there is a bit of an attitude of we've got so many trees, what's a couple here and there? And I think one of the most potent recent uh, examples of that is the trees at Ruskin Row, um, where Miranda and a band of very committed environmentalists actually stopped council from cutting down two out of four of those trees. And uh, thanks to that direct action, those trees are still standing today. So thank you for that. Um, and when you vote Greens, you don't just get that administrative support on council, you get that direct action, we'll lock onto a tree if we have to, but that's what we stand for. I want to give uh, the Labor Party a bit of a chance. Uh, yeah, we were... Uh, thanks, big, thanks, Wendy. Uh, we're big supporters of uh, increasing the tree canopy across the Northern Beaches. Uh, we think it's very important. Um, there has been a lot of lack of compliance with the council. Uh, we want to make sure that um, uh, in all regards and all domains, uh, the council's across uh, this sort of stuff and a lot of other issues that we're passionate about. Um, does that mean it, does that mean hiring more council staff? How do you how do you increase compliance? Can I answer that? Can I? Answer that? Can I, I think uh, just while I got the mic. Needs to be a bit more transparency, and uh, we need to uh, have a look. Obviously, we're, we're not councillors yet, but uh, once we get in, we'll be um, uh, having a look through the books and making sure that it's all working smoothly. Hi. Um, so, for I think all of us in the room care very passionately about the tree canopy, particularly in Pittwater. It really makes the character of that area, and. A, <laughs> Uh, and I think I saw you at, at Ruskin Avenue a couple of weeks ago doing the same thing. So thank you for your support on that. Um, I think that we do need more compliance. We do need more of council staff making sure that we can pick up when people are doing the wrong thing. However, I think we each have a role to play in citizen science. That if you see someone doing the wrong thing, that you report it. There is a line at council that you can call, and I need everyone that cares about this not to be a bystander, but to report it. Yeah, but we, all, we all know this, we're good citizens, we do report these things. I'm talking about how, from a council point of view, you would increase compliance. Not, don't tell us, we know this. Sorry. <laughs> what, what, what? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we'll come to you in some seconds. Okay, um, what I will say is compliance is a bit of a challenge because even though we have a, an opening for quite a few compliance um, officers, 
they don't easily get filled because A, who wants to be a ranger, and B, I'm um, having... A... Being a ran... Why isn't being a ranger a good job? Uh, because of the abuse that they get. So um, now we have a ruling that two have to walk together and for some cases they're wearing cameras now as well. It's, it's a bit up there with, I suppose, dentists who also feel that they're probably not liked because everyone's frightened of them. What I will add to this, and I, I know um, there's a mention in there about um, the new trees being planted, but just a, a reset there that there is 5,000 trees a year being planted. Some of them are low, some of them are high. I've, I've had the pleasure of planting both sides of the, the um, dial, if you like, there, um, which council has been doing basically since it started. Um, but we've also been targeting certain areas. So Curl Curl Ward in particular um, was kind of known for having the least amount of tree canopy. So there was very much a couple of years focus on that, but North Narra being on the dunes there, there was 5,000 plants just planted there. I imagine we're looking at um, those rezonings and those dual occupancies, mm -hmm. that that's going to be an enormous challenge to maintain or increase the tree canopy. What are your thoughts there? What, where's that? So I, I absolutely remember the issue with the 1050 clearing laws and certainly you could hear chainsaws every day um, for people removing their trees. I think the tree canopy is, is certainly extremely important, not from just a cooling effect, and I'm talking to the converted, you know, who lives in all these trees. You're right about the fact of what people do on their private land is, is a challenge because I've certainly had my neighbour try and take me to court for taking down my own tree. They wanted the tree down, I didn't. Um, it, it becomes very much a personal thing between neighbours at one stage. So it's important, I think, to remember that for some people, their fear of their trees and the reality of it is Certainly the big old eucalypts do drop um, big limbs. I've got a couple across the road from where I am. A couple of cars have certainly been damaged and I know that those neighbours have done the right thing with the tree pruning there. But in reality, um, it's very hard. And what I think was being mentioned earlier is absolutely right. If it isn't for people who care the ring, as soon as they hear or see illegal clearing, um, council can't be there because they can't be everywhere. And I've been lucky enough to be phoned a number of times by people who knew that someone thinking of selling their land and finding that they've got environmentally sensitive flora and fauna in there, their first reaction for some of them is let's clear this because then I can just sell it. Um, it really needs all of us to actually get in and, and in one case I remember um, I got a call from the council staff going, we got there as the bulldozers had just started. So it, it is an all of us together um, because we just can't have a compliance person on every corner as much as we'd love to. Um, there's, it's sort of a really multifaceted thing because although we've been going gangbusters at planting the trees, um, our follow through at caring for the trees once they've been planted can be quite patchy and that's something I think um, Miranda Causey has really been kind of leading the charge on talking about that um, she's had motions up about tree stewardship, about um, getting a tree management plan because it's, it, you know, we can't just be planting them, we have to look after them and actually account in our budget for the cost of looking over, after a tree over its lifetime. Um, something which, you know, in general councils and organisations are not very good at um, accounting for the value and ongoing costs of managing the natural environment. But, you know, it's been really great to see um, as a Greens councillor be able to fight for things like more bush care funding, about, you know, giving grants to um, Northside to do more bush care regeneration. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a, a multifaceted thing. On pri public land, we're planting lots of trees. On private land is really where the problem child is because we're losing tree canopy on private land um, at an enormous rate. And one of the problems is environmental compliance. And it's something I'm very 
personally very passionate about in my day job. I'm sort of like a crap version of the Batman. I'm like a lawyer by day and a counsellor by night. But um, my day job is literally being, uh, includes doing environmental prosecution work for other councils. And I really, really wish that we had a more proactive compliance team. And it, it just reflects that basically one of the motions I put up through that we worked out that we need to, to double the number of compliance staff looking after illegal development and clearing and actually get as well more specialised staff who actually have more technical understanding, a lot of our compliance staff in this area. So how do you, so how do you, I mean, given we heard over here, sorry. Given we've heard over here that it's a very dangerous job and that, you know, we haven't got the ranges, we haven't got the compliance staff. How, yeah, that's, how, and what we talk about compliance staff, yeah, um, yeah, different aspects, the ranges out there, compliance staff there. How do you make, how do you, um, how do you make, um, how do you beef up those departments and how, yes, and how do you attract staff to those jobs, both out in the field and uh, within council? I was just going to say what Kristen's referring to, and we can both think of who, who that particular person is, is more about um, people building illegal buildings, if you like, um, while trying to make sure, uh, 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 let's put it this way, we know who a lot of the creative builders are out there, uh, let's put it that way, and their so-called um, certifiers who will virtually say yes because of course they're getting paid to, to write a certificate that says yes. So I totally get what Kristen's saying, it's just trying to make sure that we've got the right people and you're right about that with the building compliance that's that's just a nightmare with some of our residents i feel my heart goes out yeah, to so, them so again i ask i mean how you know what how how do you how do you beef up that department is it about more money is it about um, attracting different kind of staff where do you begin with that I mean, it's all of the above. I mean, it would have been really nice if Miranda and I had a bit more support on the floor to double the compliance budget last budget, but uh, water under the bridge, I guess. Um, but it's, it's many things. I mean, our compliance staff work to the policy that they have, and our policy is very reactive. It is about reacting to complaints. If we had a properly resourced team supported by a policy that was proactive in nature, where we're not just responding to resident complaints, but we are randomly spot checking compliance officers and, and other um, environmental regulators do that proactive work because they resource it and they recognise it as a priority. And so I think it's just something as a council we need to reprioritise having staff in this area and that may mean poaching them from other councils and paying above market. It may mean that we're going to have to take on some trainees and train people up in this area. It's going to mean a lot of things. Um, updating the policy to be kind of... Is it going to mean higher rates? <laughs> well, I think it, it, maybe it will, but I mean, I think there's other things we could deprioritise big kind of splashy projects that sometimes as a council we're a little tempted by the seductions of cutting ribbons, um, maybe we should focus on, you know, the core business of looking after our natural environment. But sorry, Miranda is totally itching to say something, so I'm going to let her. Can I just say something? Yeah, apparently. Can I actually speak? Because this is the topic that I spent most of my ta time on council dealing with, and. In 2017, there was a motion from one of the Liberals to develop a tree canopy plan. That plan went to public exhibition in 2018 and it was roundly criticised. Nothing happened to it and so I spent a lot of my term on council chasing it up, following it up, trying to get it through. So finally, we got it up in September, last September. It came, it was ready, to, it came to council, it didn't actually include anything to protect or criteria to protect existing canopy. And we know that we've lost the 30,000 trees, that's without the, you know, the illegal ones and the 1050 ones. And the council has been planting, it's planted about the same number since um, 
the amalgamation. However, we know that unless you have people who want that tree to grow, it will die. And there's no way that you know a little tube stock or sapling is going to replace a 150-year-old tree with hollows for wildlife and all that sort of stuff and all the environmental functions it carries out, including protecting, you know, covering roads so that the roads don't deteriorate as quickly, so they don't need money spent on them as frequently. Um, the, the business about how dangerous trees are is a complete um, nonsense, basically. Yes, branches do fall, but there's a study that's been carried out by a, a bloke who's from the um, Arborist Association that shows that, and they've done statistics on it, that you are more likely to die falling out of bed than you are from a tree branch falling on top of you. But I imagine insurance comes into this, of course. I'm sure it would, but if, I'm sure insurance companies but also it, have the statistics. And didn't we, didn't we, from memory, didn't a lot of tree canopy wouldn't that disappear, and I remember in school grounds especially, through um, insurance companies saying that these trees are dangerous. Except that the two trees that are under you know, review at the moment in Ruskin Row and Avalon are flooded gums, which are planted frequently in schools, in public schools, and one of the Avalon arborists who has given us a report on that that has said those trees are low risk, actually has spent a large part of his career um, assessing, uh, doing risk assessments on trees in, um, in schools, in public schools. I just want to go back to the actual question on the, um, the uh, screen there about the cost of implementing these things. And I think this is one of the big issues with councils and it's a financial thing with our council, as it is across the state. Every council across the state is in financial trouble. There isn't enough money to spend on all the things we want to spend it on. And so I think what happens is money gets shifted around from one thing to another. When the tree canopy plan got up in September, the staff told me that, and I think they actually said it at a council meeting as well, that there is money there um, to basically finalise the tree canopy plan and implement it um, in last year's budget. That hadn't happened by the time, you know, a couple of months ago. The tree, one of the issues I think has also been that um, the sort of responsibility for trees has largely been with the parks and open space division. And my feeling is that they see trees as ornaments, basically. And they don't recognise the environmental function and the sort of integration of trees into the landscape environmentally. They're now moved into, that division or that section has now moved into the environment division and so I hope that things will be better going forwards. The head of the Environment Division has told me that there is now money in this year's budget um, to finalise, bed down the tree canopy plan, to develop the policy um, that we need. We need a policy for the whole of the northern beaches about our trees, so there's no mix up about, oh yeah, this applies in Pitwater and that applies in Manly and we don't know what we're doing. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm optimistic, but if, if it doesn't get up and I'm on council, I will be fighting to get that thing in place and to find the money. And if I don't end up on council, I will be doing the same thing. So. Thank you very much. You wanted to say something about this, Ryan, and I, I'm, I'm mindful that we have a couple of candidates in the middle there. We haven't given a chance for, uh, had, you haven't been given the microphone at all. So we'll get to you in just a moment. Come on, Ryan. Uh, I just want to go back to compliance. Uh, there are ways to um, uh, address that. Um, I think saying to the community, the onus is back on you to fix this and report this um, is not the way to go about things because if people don't believe in the system, they're not going to report these things because if they don't think something's going to be done about it, they're not going to pick up the phone. Simple as that. Um, and the way to recruit more people is, is pretty simple. Make their job safer. Um, Save them with guns. Well, <laughs> well we all know how that a terrible uh, outcome there. That was you want to make, you can't just say, oh, it's a bad job, it's not safe. Make it safer. You know, you've got to say, how are we going to make this job safer for them? Give them cameras. There are other ways to, to do things without confronting people in the street to investigate these sort of matters. Um, uh, we need to make the job safer, offer traineeships, get, get new people in, make it a rewarding career, um, and, and you'll get more compliance with that and more people calling up. Um, yeah. You can both have a go at that if you want. Both have a go. So, yeah, I've um, 
So I'm not on council as yet, I'm just running as a candidate, but I've been looking into this tree canopy thing and the council's tree canopy policy. At the moment, the commitment is to, and um, the plan that was developed in September 2023, go through for the next four years, is that right, Sue? So the commitment is to plant 5,000 trees per year, but also at the moment the site and the vision is to do this for the next 20 years. And that includes low trees as well as high trees because every tree needs a succession plan. And I think that's a really great commitment from Council and I hope that it keeps... A bit like the Murdoch family. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not actually going all that well. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on something that Miranda said about every council being in financial struggle at the moment. And, and I think we all know the impacts of rising energy costs and, uh, you know, and inflation and inflation rates has impacted everybody. And so it is important to acknowledge that. It's also important to acknowledge not just the tree canopy locally, but how to pull back and think about native forest logging across New South Wales, across a, a labor run state. And I think we all remember 18 months ago that there was a promise for the Great Koala National Park and preserving those trees and very little has been done. I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated and what I really admire about being in an independent group of people, as we've seen Michael Regan and Sophie Scomps federally and at a state level have been able to advocate for native forest logging to stop like it has in Victoria. And I think that is extremely important because a size of the Sydney CBD gets cut down every day okay. across our state. Thank you. So well, thank I would, you for that. That is a state issue. Though. It is, but I wanted to yeah. be sure yeah. that at council level, we need to make sure that the opinions of the community mm -hmm. are represented. And I think most of us are in, in agreement uh, about what actually needs to happen. I just wonder what Vince DeLuca and Mandeep Singh feel on this issue as well, because I think their, their voice is important. Thank you, thank you for that. I'm going to ask, uh, throw some questions out to you. I think we've just pretty much um, covered what we have there on the board generally. Um, I just want, um, I missed your name, I'm sorry, I forget. Judith, why don't you ask you a question? And I think um, we might um, Before start Before you ask the question, can I just make a comment? Mm -hmm, sure. I'm standing as number two in the Pitwater Ward. I was told that I didn't have to actually say anything this evening because I'm only a number two. Therefore, I have come with no notes, no anything except my... No, problem. I was going to ask you a very general well, question. Well, I just want to make a comment too. Yep. We've been talking about seawalls, we've been talking about trees, we've been talking about Narrabin Lagoon. For many, many years, I taught geology at Cromer High School. I am an absolute avid lover of geology, rocks, environmental assets, etc., etc. I remember saying to my geology kids at one stage that Francis Bacon, back in 1700, said that um, nature to be controlled must be obeyed. And I think that's something we are forgot forgetting. Let's build the sea walls. Nature says, no, we're not gonna do that. Let's do whatever, you know, let's pump sand from Narrabin down to DY. So nature just brings it back again, because that's longshore drift. I think we're not realizing that we have to fit in with nature, but we're also forgetting we want to live here. I had to knock a tree down to build my house. I've built many trees since, of course. You've got to knock a tree or two down to build a road. I went out and had a look at those Ruskin road trees because I'd never seen them. And I'm going to probably get shot down here, but I can see their problem. They have reached their use by date because they're only a certain type of tree. They don't actually drop branches in such a way that produces big knobs and knobs and holes for animals to live in. They are not good habitat trees. They're lovely trees, yes, but they're not good habitat trees. And I'm not saying, therefore, go and knock every single tree down in the world, but I think we've got to get that happy medium. We want this as long as this also works. And I'm getting a bit concerned here that there's so much angst going on between one and the other. I don't know whether I want to get on council anymore anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, that was... Uh... Yeah, that was a bit of a Mel Meninga moment then. No, I'm sorry. So, so Judith and I, in 
Ian, like the people at Award, we had a bit of a get together in our orange and we did go down to Russell and we saw the trees together and yeah. we were standing there looking at them and then this guy comes around on his bike, didn't he Judith? And he was a tree expert, was he? I can't remember his name, but he said he was an arborist, arborist but also while we were there, someone else walked their dog. So they're obviously locals. And they both said they're very concerned about these trees because yes, they're dropping branches. Yes, somebody has had their car damaged. Now it's all very well for us to say, leave them there. But if they do knock out the window of a BMW, who's gonna pay? The rate payers insurance? All right, can we, can we just, I mean, can we leave this here? We haven't seen the trees. We don't know the issue. It's very specific for us to be talking about tonight. I would like to move on. Um, I'd like to ask if you've got any questions. One thing I would like to ask all of you, um, and then Ethan, I might get you to answer this. Where, and you know, you run for a few campaigns now. How many campaigns? The fourth. You might be, this might be lucky this time. I wonder when you are out and about and you're speaking to people and you're door knocking, what is the general you know, consensus, you know, the vibe of the thing. When people talk to you about the Northern Beaches Council, what, what, what is the feedback that you get generally? Thanks, Wendy. Um, so I'm, I'm proud to say that so far we've knocked on about two and a half thousand houses in French's Forest alone. Um, and, you know, I speak to people and it's, it's quite lovely. A lot of people are very happy with where they live. They feel very lucky and it's an incredible place to raise a family. Um, but it really comes down to the bread and butter issues. You know, people want footpaths. They want to be able to take their pram out to the park with their kids. Um, they want things like proper stormwater management, you know, playing fields for their soccer teams. Um, so I think if council is compassionate and they listen to the community, there's so much we can do. And when we put forward ideas like, well, we could be more sustainable, we could support you to start composting, we could implement food organics and garden organics, and these are ideas that they're really receptive to, but it never would have crossed their mind that council could actually provide them okay. with that service. Oh. So uh, I've actually had a really inspiring time doing it. Oh, yeah. well, that's good. And um, what about up here? Is there someone around, out and about for the, not the first time perhaps, but you've been out and about amongst the electorate um, coming up to this election? And what are you, what's your, the feedback that you're getting on how council is going and how the general vibe of the thing, as I say? Well, I have to say, Narrabee Ward is a fairly happy ward. Um, uh, oh, a happy ward's a good ward, yeah. Happy, happy <laughs> ward's a good ward, and so um, the main concerns is our lagoon, and um, it's um, the uh, rock pool, and at the moment, the lagoon is, at the moment, um, is travelling really, I, I say it's travelling really well, I go there just about every day, I view it, the water is sparkling, and there are a lot of people swimming, and I see that as a really good well-being thing. Talking to people around, um, it's, and it has been the last couple of weeks in particular, they're concerned for the future of, with regarding the politics of, you know, what's gone on. And um, generally speaking, Breakers Parkway is uh, of concern, and um, that's about it really, you know. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, um, time for some um, time for some questions for you up the back there, sir, in the orange. Um, I'll use this mic. Yeah, yeah. Go right here. I mean, it's getting a bit difficult with the mic. I know. You're welcome to come up here and take this one if you want. I'd like to ask both the audience and their candidates: How many of you know that Lord of Beaches Council declared a climate emergency five years, six days, and half an hour ago? <laughs> and, and yet that was our main question, the first question, and it hasn't even been asked. What do you think about net zero? Net zero. How are we going to get there? Net zero. What is your? Well, it's the first question. Can we get on to the first question somewhere up there? So um, yes, so I was around on council when that was declared um, by a wonderful Greens councillor. Uh, we supported it, and yes, um, aware that um, we're still kind of. Uh, I mean, I had a look. I was a bit disappointed when I saw that things that Natalie had created, like um, there's a, on council's website you can actually view suburb by suburb, um, your solar, um, uh, all kinds of um, emissions, um, it's all there, but it's now, 
I think about two years out of date. Normally it's kept up to date year by year. So it's still very much a part of it, but I'm also aware that as a team, we voted a bit differently from each other on this particular topic. I remember when um, we had the debate at the last council meeting, which was a bit of a, um, an interesting council meeting, the last one, because everyone knew it was the last one, um, that it was just challenging, I think, to really listen to everyone's everyone's different thoughts and on policies and um, I still remember the Liberal councillor who was talking about that if you go all electric, um, that if you have a pacemaker you can't have an induction cooktop. That one really stood in my mind as how desperate a straw that was to use that as an excuse. But that's what we were dealing with. <laughs> Interesting. Yes, you would have responded. So, look, um, Nigel, um, I put up the motion. This this question actually comes from my motion, um, calling for um, basically a ban on gas um, fixtures in any new development. And it wasn't on existing properties. If you've got gas in your home, like me, you know, you don't have to get rid of it tomorrow. Unfortunately, it wasn't just the Liberals who didn't support it. There were also votes from your Northern Beaches that didn't support it. And it was a very simple proposal. In actual fact, the State Government won't let us um, ban gas in the DCP, the Development Co Control Plan, which is part of the planning sort of apparatus. Um, it won't let us ban it on climate grounds. We can only do it, or we can do it on any other grounds, but not climate grounds, which is the most bizarre setup I can imagine. So 350.org came to me and some of the other councillors and said, well, how about we put it up on cost of living and health grounds? And um, we, so we did that. We had speakers um, from, um, Connie was one of them. And Nigel, I thought you spoke for it as well. And, um, and it was quite clear that it's much cheaper because if you have one um, energy source fitted to your home, you don't have to pay for two, um, like the cost of maintaining supply, two suppliers. Um, and obviously the cost of gas is just going through the roof. Um, and there's all sorts of chemicals that you end up with that are carcinogenic in your home when you're using gas heaters and gas stoves. And benzene was one of them, and Connie could tell us more about it. So, that was a, a way of trying to do this one thing because what we can do in council, you know, we don't have the, the scope that the federal and state governments have um, for taking climate action, but it's one thing we could do on council. And it's something that we'll pursue because I hope that with a new council, um, we'll be able to get more people on board and have a more reasoned argument about it. Debate, not argument. Um, can, can I answer that? that? Sorry, can I answer that question as well? Can I answer that question as well? No? Yeah, just quickly. Yes. Just quickly? Oh, okay. Um, so I've been on Council's Environmental Strategic Reference Group for um, 18 months or something now, and um, I also do a lot of volunteer work. And what in this space, and what I'm noticing is that politics and the ideology of energy transition is really troublesome, and I think we all get frustrated with that. What I can see Council is already doing is doing some things that reduce costs for everybody. And I think that that is ultimately anti-inflationary. So I think that there is a space for us to make sure that we are implementing some of these ideas that are ultimately going to benefit the community. And we know that homes can be reduced by 75% in running costs with some energy saving features. So there is plenty of opportunity for us. I think the conversation needs to be happened looking at the economics of it. Okay, thank you. A question, yeah, yes? Just with the circular economy, mm. what's the situation of the council with soft plastics? Yeah, okay, do we have a soft plastics policy? Would you like to answer that? Yeah. Um, 
So Council, during the last term, endorsed a new waste and circular economy strategy, which um, was a really great work done by, um, with contributions from the Environment Strategic Reference Group. So it also kind of feels like a bit of a reunion um, of the SRG at the moment, because half of us are here right now. But um, yeah, one of the, the challenges with soft plastics, and I did put up a motion about it, is is twofold. It is in our strategy to look at new opportunities to, to recycle it, but I think we have to have a pretty nuanced discussion that soft plastics really shouldn't have a future as part of packaging mix. Um, any, and so how, what sort of investment should council sensibly put into something that shouldn't have a future? And I put that as an open question. We ran a trial and we made sure that the soft plastics we collected in that trial had a real um, end of life. But, um, you know, people are great at collecting soft plastics, but there isn't an end market for it, and the only way you could really create one would be to mandate minimum recycled product content, which is something we would really need the federal government to do. But as a bit of a provocation, because I have a lot of people say, why aren't we, why doesn't council pay for Recycle Smart? And, it, and, and I sort of come back to, um, you know, this is a waste stream that is derived from fossil fuels. So by having it in part of your packaging mix, you keep us in, in using, having demand for fossil fuels. Um, different types of soft plastics are harder to recycle than others. Some of them have polymers that break down quite easily. So there's really a limited extent to which you can keep them in the circular economy. I'd be remiss if I didn't um, mention Keela and say that generating soft plastics creates demand for other types of end of life like waste incineration. Keela, I got out the key word. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, so um, I'm not opposed to soft plastics, but I think we have to have a nuanced discussion that it shouldn't, we should all be, any amount of money we spend on recycling, it has to be with an acknowledgement that it is short term and that there is, should not be a future for soft plastics because it is not po possible to make it genuinely circular. Uh, yes, thanks everybody. Um, besides, uh, I'm talking about young people, keeping them on our peninsula so they don't have to move out. And besides cost of living, of course, and housing and, and the surf, what ideas does the panel have to keep um, innovative ideas to keep our young people in the next year. Well, let's ask a young person. Uh, I'm actually one year older than Ethan, so Ethan's officially the youngest, but I'll take this one. Uh, one of the three pillars that I am running for on my policy platform is affirming the role of arts in our economy. I have seen a massive move of all the talented artists born and raised on the Northern Beaches, born and raised with the connection to land that we all have, go to the inner west because there's no spaces for them to be here. And I think we've seen, you know, there's always panic about young people being in public and getting into trouble. What is the third place for young people at the moment? Manly Corso is within my ward and I have a big vision of what can we do in Manly Corso. There's a lot of very expensive development plans right now which I don't really think coincide with Council's budget being so far into the red, but I'm advocating for more community-based events where we give small amounts of money directly to young people, directly to artists of all ages really, to get more things happening in public spaces so people can come down with their family, with their friends and see music happening in Manly Corso from 4 to 6 p.m. It's, it's not unreasonable, you know? Having um, levies passed for so young people can rent pub, um, public spaces and hold events. Like these things, we shouldn't be afraid of these things. We need young people on the beaches. And more than that, we need young people in politics. And I just want to underline today that electing Ethan and I is not a risk. It's a necessity. It's time to bar pass the baton to the people who are going to be dealing with the fallout of this climate crisis, this housing crisis, and this mental health crisis. So thank you for your question, Kylie. But um, yes, I think we definitely need some more voices on council speaking for younger people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I, uh, I myself was involved in, um, in council politics. Oh, it's going to be a decade ago now. And um, with uh, the original Wake Up Warringah group. And uh, there we, we put a lot of work into a, an arts precinct in Brookvale, which went nowheresville pretty much. 
Um, no, no, no. It's, no, it's no, there in this, there in, in this, black and white. Yeah, this it, it, uh, yeah, it took a long, long time yeah. for anything to But happen. that's because we did have also um, a lot of um, investment in creatives up north and down south. And mm -hmm. in the middle, of course, we turned the old scout hall yep. into a creative centre. So it's been actually fascinating to watch how many different types of creatives are coming out as well. And now we've also done a, um, a grant, if you like, with the music industry, so that there's about to be a whole heap of very musical events coming out for young people as well. We've actually got a great youth team, um, and it's really important that for the youth, there's a whole heap of different things, because not everyone plays sport, even though we do have a very active community who love playing sport, but the creatives in particular, and also skateboarding, all of that kind of stuff that we've been going through has been really important just to make people feel that they're keen here. Something that worked really well and is now kind of dying a bit at the moment from too much love is the 24-7 library at Forestville um, because it has become such a hot spot for not only our locals but young people coming in all to study the HSC um, in their own space. So I know that we're looking at trying to do something with mainly library as well because it is the young people that gives them a safe place to go after hours and, and have their own space for themselves, which is a great use of our libraries that are sitting there otherwise unused a hell of a lot of the time. Okay, I know there's a couple of comments here. Are you like to have another quick word? I just want to validate um, my position to speak on the arts and to represent the arts. I'm a musician. I go in freestyle rap competitions. I've performed stand-up comedy across the world, including in Joe Rogan's club, if you've ever heard of Joe Rogan. He's, he's contentious. Um, so I think another skill set that I'm really excited to offer to council is the ability to connect with people, sure, but also to, whenever I have been door knocking, I haven't door knocked as much as Ethan, I knock on people's doors and they go, oh, local council elections coming up, what? and I didn't hear about that. And I asked, did you know we just had all these fabulous music events happening in Manly Corso, down in Brookvale, people go, I had no idea. There is a gap between all the services that council are delivering and people receiving them at their homes. It's hard to make content and events sexy, but I think we just might need a little bit of creativity to deliver the creativity. Okay, thank you very much. Stand up, Meridian on Council. Excuse what would be wrong with that, eh? <laughs> Excuse me, I'd like to say something about you. So I no, I, I, okay, I, actually, I beg your pardon, sorry. I did promise the Labor Party that they have a bit of a word here. Excuse well, I me. think I've got the right, because I'm the oldest person in the room. <laughs> I took a different take on your question. Um, I took it as how do we keep our children here on the Northern Beaches. I've got two kids, one's 30, one's 26. They both would love to stay on the Northern Beaches. They can't afford a house. They can barely afford the rent. Um, my daughter's moving to Lane Cove, it's cheaper over there. And my son will probably move out to Camden Way with his fiance. Um, the, I think the answer to keeping them here is obviously more housing. We need more affordable housing. A lot of things come down to that. The other thing too is really good local jobs. So, you know, we used to have apprenticeships on council, um, the local TAFE, we had two local TAFEs. So, our state government, the Labor Party, have just announced um, an amazing scheme for local council apprentices, apprenticeships. Um, so that keeps your kids in the area, it keeps them learning, and then that all feeds back into the community. What, what area are those apprenticeships in? Um, it's across a really broad range okay. of areas. Yeah, yeah. So we could have arborists, right. we could have coastal yeah. management experts, we could have um, electricians, sparkies, all sorts of things. Whatever the apprenticeships are, and it would really help build up our local TAFE as well, that would help local teachers, all that kind of thing. But for those local teachers to live here and teach our kids who want to live here, we need more houses. So. I'll be very quick, but I think I'm obviously the oldest person sitting here anyway, but that doesn't mean that I can't say something about youth. I've been mentoring youth for a long, long time as a school teacher. 
I've done environmental plans in schools with businesses, etc. I've got a program up in Timor Leste where I teach youth and I do sporting competitions and so on. I think what we need here is to encourage our youth to be our leaders because there are some fantastic young people out there who've got great ideas but don't actually have the words to bring them out. I was working, or I still work with an organisation called Oz Green. They used to be based in DUI, you probably know of them. They're now based up in Bellingham and they run a youth leading the world organisation project. They literally have young people from every country in the world doing youth facilitation, etc. They've just won run, won run, run one at the Coastal Environment Centre and it went very, very well. They got students from the local schools get together, they have three or four days talking about what are our issues, what are we going to do about it, what do we want our future to look like, where are we going from here, they then present all those ideas. Now they run these often, they might have 20 kids at each session, three or four go on and do amazing things. Are you saying that we should have uh, one of those um, uh, development courses here? What's, what, we've, we've, we've just, we've just, we've, all right, okay. we've just had, they've just had one. Okay. But coming out of Youth League, um, Australian Youth Council, that was one of the youth leaders. Right. There's been some amazing projects, so I think we need to offer our young people those sorts of opportunities. Okay. Well, that All is right. giving well, them power. I, are we gonna, I'm going to wrap this up now because we are, are going to. I want to go around to this group here and I want them to tell me how they will be, if they are elected on council, how they imagine that they will conduct themselves to achieve harmony, to achieve policies with real outcome, I guess to reduce um, disharmony, obviously, squabbling and all that kind of business. Um, so can I ask you first, I mean, is, can, I, can we get a commitment from you about um, this new makeup of council, that it will be a harmonious and an effective group. I'll give an, a, com a commitment that I will certainly try my hardest to make as harmonious as possible. However, I also believe in testing ideas, and quite often one person's idea, as much as it seems like I've got the answer, quite often if you like, having that debate with someone else means that between the two of you, even though you don't necessarily agree, quite often come out, up with an outcome that's better than what either of you came up with. So I do agree in actually having that vigorous discussion, but certainly not um, anything personal. And something that I've learnt on council over many years is it's never personal. I don't want to see people going for each other personally and quite often I have turned off microphones to stop what I see as an attack about to happen. And I absolutely guarantee that with a whole bunch of fresh new faces trying to work together, I want to make those ideas still being tested but that we actually work collaboratively together would be fabulous. All right, we'll just pass the microphone. We'll go right, we'll go right down to the group and we'll finish up. Um, thank you. Uh, not a fresh face. If I get elected, it'll be second term. I consider myself, I'm a person with integrity. I listen. I'm very passionate about what I believe in and I appreciate being part of a group with the Your Northern Beaches Independent Team, being that we are all collectively at independence and work collaboratively together. So there's a lot of respect for the difference of opinion and there's also space to have that authentic discussion. I also know, uh, with our colleagues on the other side, that uh, we, we have that space in our briefings on Tuesday night. We've had really good um, conversations or discussions where we um, usually have an agenda item of uh, where the staff brings different items that are coming up to the council meeting and we can discuss them at a different level than in the public eye. And we, we, I think it works well with those that attend and I would like to see that continue and I'm sure that they will. All right, thank you. Just a, a minute or so, Go on. Okay, so I've got a lot of you, a few of you in the room know me and these guys do, but I have a massive passion for um, solutions based on my ability to listen and communicate. And as a new candidate um, and 
possibly going on to council. I intend to represent the different needs of pit water and other wards in the community and, and really make a difference. And I've, I've done that in Newport on a grassroots level with the work that I've done with the Newport Chamber of Commerce, which is Miranda is also very aware of. Um, I'm a community voice with integrity and I believe in the creation of better communities. There's nothing like it. Okay. Creating working relationships between business, residents and interested parties and associations like they're here tonight, actually um, getting that all together for the betterment of local outcomes and greater living. All right, that's your, that's your jam. Okay. Having taught in high schools for many years, and when I first started teaching, I was at Wagga Wagga High School way back in, I won't tell you when it was, a long time ago, but it was in the days when they used to grade classes from A right down to F and G, and that's because Wagga High School had one and a half thousand kids. I was being the new teacher, I was given a 7F and a 3G, and I, and I looked at those kids, and I thought to myself, I didn't know these sorts of children exist. And then I started teaching them and I loved them because they had their own ideas and I was prepared to listen. And I think it's been the greatest thing way back then. You have to learn to accept everybody for what they are. You have to listen to everybody's opinion and take it all on board and never tell anyone they are wrong. Because as Sue said, you listen to different ideas and something new comes out of it. So that's the sort of attitude I would take to council not negotiate, not pretend that they're like three F's and three G's, but you know, <laughs> you never know at times. But I think you've got to be prepared to take everything on board, listen to it, don't straight away say, no, nah, don't like that. Listen, see what they've got to say, because we all love living on the northern beaches. We all want the same thing in the end. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I don't quite know the questions, but I'll see how I go. Um, so someone asked me recently what skills I will bring to council and I think what I'm going to bring is compassion and collaboration and I think with the polarisation of politics we really need to lead with that so that we can find the solutions that the community deserves and I feel like politics has been a race to the bottom and I'm very much looking forward to working with the community and with my colleagues to, to have a contest of ideas of what is best rather than racing to the bottom. Thank you for that. Um, over the last, I don't know, 30 odd years, I've done a lot of activism and with different causes, like ferries, hospitals, um, buses, um, it's not always just a labour cause. You know, there's um, people from all political parties and uh, independents and people that aren't political on our committees. Um, we all work together. Uh, we do a really good job. We've had some amazing results. But the crux of that is that we respect each other's opinions and ideology and you go around the table and you work out what's best for the, the cause or the issue. So I think, I think that's a good way to approach working on council if I was elected. Um, I do like collaborating, I do like thrashing out ideas, you might not always agree, you might get a little bit heated, but ultimately it's the best result for whatever it is that you're fighting for at the time. Uh, council doesn't work unless we all uh, work together in the same direction. Uh, I think that goes without saying. Um, what I will say though is uh, voting for us as the Labor candidates, we're in a unique position uh, where we can have those robust discussions with the state and federal governments, uh, where from day one we'll be going and having those discussions to make sure that Northern Beaches gets its fair share. Um, I really like this that you is in law enforcement and you're going to have some frank and firm discussions. Well, yeah. It's actually cheering me up enormously. We'll put on the tough talk. Um, no, we'll, we'll have those robust discussions. Um, you know, I think it goes without saying, a lot of people here will agree that uh, the, the former state and federal government sort of left us behind for, for a long time. Um, they always promised us the world and they delivered nothing. So we want to reverse that and, and give Northern Beaches its fair share. All right. Thanks. Um, well, I think. One of the biggest things I bring to the Chamber is my professional background. I'm a planning and environment lawyer and so I use my ex professional experience working for 
and against other councils, I bring that to the chamber and can take that sort of sky view of how is council functioning at a broader level, um, what are the big planning issues and the environment issues, and really, I think I hit the ground running. I look at things from many perspectives. I've been a director of a cooperative that was doing solar panel investments. I was previously a disability support worker. Um, I think that looking at things from many perspectives has really helped me because we are a diverse community that has a range of interests, and I try to be really fair about representing all of those interests um, I think that for those who have um, a masochistic element and watch the council meetings and are not paid to, they will have seen that I have a really measured and collaborative approach and I think that that's been borne out that, you know, lots of my motions have been either unanimously supported or supported by a large number of um, Liberal Party members as well as um, Greens and Y and B. So I think that that speaks to my ability to kind of work across the table. Um, I'm a parent of a young family. I think my young family is floating around somewhere. I was actually seven months pregnant when I was elected the first time round. So poor old Hugo had his first ballot draw in utero and has been dragged to elections and council things since. I actually was like, had gave birth, uh, yeah, after my first council meeting and was breastfeeding at the first one. So. Um, I think if you want something done well, sometimes you need to ask a busy person and bloody hell am I busy at the moment. Um, so I, I try to represent young families and I think it's good that we have different types of people on council. I mean, before I had my son, I didn't notice where we didn't have cut curbs because I could just step up onto the footpath. Suddenly you're pushing a pram around and you find all of the lack of cut curbs and for people who um, have, you know, family members who use wheelchairs, I'm sure you also know where those cat c cut curbs do not exist. So I think it's, I I'm able to represent part of our demographic and I think it's good that we have a whole range of people so that everyone can look at the chamber and hopefully see someone that's like them. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, what you, what you plan to bring to council, we, we, really, we've just moved on a little, just generally the skills that you're bringing? I am an academic in politics, international relations and social legal studies. Well, you're is... completely overqualified in that case. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would like to put in a caveat here. I only joined the Greens 10 months ago and that was because I really wanted to make sure that I was on the right side of this big rat race, which is called politics. And that's no hate, we have democracy for a reason. Every party plays its role. But the Greens put four pillars of environmental justice, social justice, peace and nonviolence, and grassroots democracy is completely in line with who I am. So what I bring is the ability, even if I was elected, I'm still gonna be door knocking every weekend. I'm still be saying, this is what happened in the last council election. How do you feel about that? Isn't that crazy? People go, yeah, that is crazy. I'm like, well, what should we do? And they go, that's your job. And I'll go, oh God. <laughs> in short, I'm, I'm really willing to ask a lot of questions. I'm really willing to lean on my senior councillors for advice on, on all sides. I recognize you know, the talents that come before me and I'm willing to sit there in the good faith that we are all in this for the same reason, because we care about our community and we love where we live. Thank and I you. think that's it, yeah. Thank you. Um, so one of the missions of the Office of Local, uh, Local Government is to ensure that councils represent a broad cross-section of the communities that they govern. And what I can offer as a councillor is a young voice, but also a voice that hasn't been corrupted by developer interests or by <laughs> big, big donations. Um, but, uh, the Office of Local Government has a fact sheet about young people running for council and the headline for that is a statistic and it's that 52.6% of councillors in New South Wales are between 50 and 69 years old. So that's over half and these are the people that are making the decisions that people like Bonnie and I are going to be feeling the effects of for a couple decades into the future. So effectively we've been historically underrepresented for so long and we've been left out of the debate and decision making that we're able to provide a strong voice and advocate for young people and what's important to us. But also what's important to the community because as has been said before, we all love the Northern Beaches and part of that is ensuring that the next generation gets to as well. So that's what we'll stand for. Um, I 
Okay, so I'm a journo and I'm used to asking Prime Ministers and Premiers difficult questions. So um, I'm, I don't shy away from difficult questions and, um, and I don't shy away from debate either. And so I actually think it's a very important part of, of Council. Uh, I'm also an activist and as Sue's mentioned and we've fought on the Save Monobile Hospital Committee together and so I'm used to working, and also on the Protect Pit Water Committee, fighting to get Pit Water Council back. And we had people from all political persuasions on that. So I'm used to working with people from, you know, all walks of life. Um, and I'm also a mother of two adult children, so I've seen it all at this point, and I think with that background, you can do just about anything, those three things, that combination. Um, so, but I think my main focus is to be a voice for Pitwater, for the people who have the same values as me, who are likely to vote for me. And I've, I think I've been that on council and I intend to keep doing that and um, if I'm elected, re-elected. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Well, a big round of applause for all our candidates. And thank you for coming along tonight. And thank you very much, Connie and Co, for organising this evening. Oh, you, you're very late in proceedings. One, it's not a question, I just wanted to thank. Oh, good. And I'm very happy that I attended tonight. Oh, good. It's going to be a lot of more confidence in the future. I've lived in the area for 65 years. I'll be 80 next birthday. Three children, 10 grandchildren, one great grandchild, all born in the little position. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you. Are you still worried about missing out on the Liberal Party though now? I think it's undemocratic. Mm, okay. That's my opinion. Okay. And I think we should have been given the choice mm -hmm. of, being, of having the choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good on. Well, you and know, the, you'll have to take session. that up with the Liberal Party. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's their, it was their problem. Yeah, it's their problem. But it's a pity that they weren't given an opportunity to rebuild. Okay. So that's my well, thank you all for coming and... Oh, you want to say one thing? Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night.